Okay, welcome back. So we're talking about this prayer, the Shema, that's written up here. Right, the, the words go Shema Yisrael Hashem Eloheinu Hashem Echad. And what I talked about last video was an English translation of this prayer, which is, Listen, Israel, this thing we call God that we don't have a very good name for, our God, this thing we call God that we don't have a very good name for, is one. And I asked you to, to think about what what it meant for God to be one a little bit. But now I'm going to talk about this thing we call God that we don't have a very good name for. Um, so, the history of th this word is a very interesting history. right? So I mentioned that the word Yahweh was the word of a local volcano deity that was worshipped by the ancestors of the Israelites before they lived in Israel, probably. Um, and, and he was one of a polytheistic pantheon. I know that his spouse was named Asherah, and Asherah is actually mentioned in the Old Testament one or two times. There's mention of a few other gods in the Old Testament, but it's unclear if they came from the Canaanite tradition or, or where they came from. I don't, I don't know the answers to that. But the point is that it's, it's indisputable fact that before Judaism was a monotheistic religion, it was a polytheistic religion. There's no doubt about that. And this word Yahweh is a um, is a, a fossil from from that earlier time. Um, now the the circumstances upon which the transition occurred from monotheistic to poly from polytheistic to monotheistic those are that's such a fascinating question. I would love to know the answer to that question. Uh, maybe we'll get an answer to that question at some point, um, but there isn't much of a fossil record because these monotheistic religions, they do a pretty good job at covering up their tracks and, and portraying history as if it were always this way, you know, <laughs> like, uh, you see that a lot today, um, with, you know, various creationism debates and whatnot, like the, the poly, the monotheisms, they have this, this desire to describe the current view of the world as if it were always the view of the world that this is this is what we've known for all time um it's kind of a very like revisionist version of history um yeah so so the ancient israelites they they worshiped a god named yahweh and he was a big dude that came out of a volcano um and then as the religion developed, that that concept stopped being as meaningful, and so it was amended. So an early interpretation of the Shema would have gone, Shema Yisrael Yahweh Eloheinu Yahweh Echad. Um, and there, Echad would have been interpreted not as one, but as alone. Right, so listen, Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh alone, as in only worship Yahweh, you idiot, um, because at this stage you have these Israelites who had entered into Canaan, and there was there was an ongoing conflict between worshiping the gods of Israel and worshiping the gods of Canaan, um, represented by this creator god El, who I mentioned is is embedded into this word Eloheinu. So originally the Shema was not a statement of, of the divine unity of all things. It was a statement saying, hey, only worship our God, dummy, um, which is not nearly as meaningful. Listen, Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. Don't worship El. Don't worship Baal. Don't worship Asherah. Those are bad gods to worship. Um, but note, it doesn't actually deny the ontological existence of those gods, right? It, nowhere in that interpretation, uh, Yahweh alone, nowhere in that interpretation is it saying, like, those other gods don't exist. It's just saying, don't worship them, because Yahweh's better. Right? So that's a really critical distinction between, like, God being everything, and there's how could there ever be a different kind of God, right? It would all just be some subset of the infinite, right? That interpretation, and, okay, Yahweh is still an agent in the world. There are other agents, but you should just worship Yahweh, like... I could go to McDonald's or Burger King, but I like McDonald's better, so I'm going to go there. Actually, you should go to neither of them, because they're both false idols. But, that's
that's another story. Um, right, so then the Babylonian exile happened. Right, so the, the empire of Babylon came in and conquered Israel, and then they were exiled, and then the Assyrian empire conquered the Babylonian empire and decided it would be politically expedient to let the Jews return to Israel and rebuild their temple so that they could have a nice ally and politics and blah, blah, blah. And politics gets wedded to history in in the Jewish tradition in this like really intense way or, or like divinity gets wedded to history in this really intense way and and then that's why there's all of this intense push towards a revisionist history where you don't you don't recognize your roots because I don't know I, I don't I don't know how to think about history and time that's kind of why I'm doing this channel is repeating the same thing over and over again so I understand what time is um, but anyway so the Babylonian exile happened, and then 70 years later, the Jews were allowed to return. And when they returned, the definition of God changed a lot. Because there had been all of these prophets for the last hundred years or so who were saying really apocalyptic things about Israel being conquered and all of the Israelites being sinners and and all of this you know like terror doom and gloom like you're not your religion's wrong you're interpreting it poorly God is going to punish you and then all of a sudden this big historical event happens and like they get ousted from their homeland and 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 the prophets were like we told you so like obviously you weren't worshiping Yahweh properly because that's why the Babylonians came like it's not that like you know there were complex geopolitical forces and economic activities going on that made it politically expedient for the Babylonians to take over Israel no 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 it was divine will divine will did it and and now you need to amend your religion because clearly God wants you to um, and so when the Jews were allowed to return and rebuild their temple and reestablish what their religion was, the voices of those prophets suddenly sounded a lot truer. Isaiah and, and all of the other ones who were, um, you know, saying that we really need to focus on this monotheism in a really big way. Um, so one of the changes that happened after the Babylonian exile was that the word Yahweh stopped being pronounced. The word Yahweh was pronounced uh, up until 576 BC, the Babylonian exile, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, I, I could be totally wrong with all these details about my history, I'm not a historian, I'm, I'm trying to make a biosemiotic point here, it's just, it's taking me a while. Um, yeah, Yahweh, Yahweh stopped being pronounced after the Jews returned, because they realized that in order to back up the kind of claims that they were making about God and divine will, he couldn't just be like another strong man on the field with Baal. Like it that the fact that he was better than everybody was was not metaphysically satisfying enough. It couldn't just be that he was better than everybody. It had to be that he was the totality of all. And um so they said this decree, which is that no one is allowed to use the name Yahweh anymore, except for the high Levitic priest in the temple precincts on the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur. So they sanctified this word Yahweh beyond all possible recognition in order to, to try to re-imbue it with the sense of divinity that it had lost, or to give it a higher order of divinity that, that it had never had before. Um, so they said that you're not allowed to say Yahweh unless you're the priest and you're in the temple and it's Yom Kippur, which is, you know, basically no one except for this one crazy dude, right, who probably wrote the law. Um, and so instead they started using pseudonyms. So the most common pseudonym that they started using was Adonai, uh, which means the Lord, because this was a very patriarchal dominating society. Um... But if you look in the Torah, it doesn't, it's still spelled Yahweh, like the, the letters, the four letters, the tetragrammaton, still, if you were to pronounce it in Hebrew, it would be Yahweh, but they say Adonai anyway. Um, and uh, that worked out well for like 500 years, uh, but God, it was really impersonal, you know, it's like really, really impersonal, you can't say the name of your God, like that's, that's tough. And... Uh, so then this guy Jesus came along and he was like actually a guy like he was a dude with with a, a, a physical body and a name and he started saying all these things 
uh, that were like pretty different from some of the things that people had been the other prophets in the Old Testament had been saying before. But it was also like kind of the same thing, like the kingdom of heaven is going to come and God is going to, you know, make everything fixed and, and all of this stuff like that was contiguous. But but Jesus was like a guy. And, and it's a lot easier to empathize with, with like a human with a face than it is to empathize with, with a, a, an entity that you're literally not allowed to say the name of because you'll, you'll miscomprehend it. Like that's a, that's a, a tough sell. So um, Jesus came around and that's when, when this idea really took off is when it, when it had a, a useful avatar to, to embody it. Um, but, you know, not all the Jews wanted to, wanted to, to worship Jesus. Uh, and so they kept on, they kept on worshiping their, their Yahweh that they're not allowed to say the name of. Um, and then this word Hashem, I don't know exactly when Hashem started to be used. I know it's used today more colloquially than Adonai, because even Adonai now has kind of like an aura of holiness and you're not supposed to say the word Adonai except if you're in a synagogue. Um, so if you're outside of a synagogue, people, some people use the word Hashem. I much prefer to use the word Hashem because I think that what we're talking about here is names and the, the, the inability for names to actually capture the thing that they are trying to refer to. And like, what is a symbol and how does anything symbolize anything? Like this mystery of, of what symbolism is and what reference is and what meaning is, is tied up in, in the inability of the Jewish religion to decide what to call its God. Um, and, and so I use the word Hashem because I think the name is, is, is the best way to, to get at that idea that like the name is not the name, right? The name is not, the name of the name is not the name. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that, that sheds an interesting light on this prayer, right? Shema Yisrael Hashem Eloheinu Hashem Echad. Listen, Israel. The name of our God, the name is one. Listen, Israel, the nameless, our God, the nameless, is one. Could be either or. Um, so there's just a whole lot there. What does it mean for this nameless thing to be one, to be everything? And um, th that's this is the question, right? I ended the last video on this question. What does it mean for God to be one? I'm going to end this video on this question. What does it mean for God to be one? I don't have an answer to that question. I don't think that's an answerable question. I think that that's a, a, a question of religious experience. I don't think it can be answered in words. I just said it. God is one. That's what it means. To experience it is something different. And there's not much I can say about it. I, I mean, I've been saying a lot of things. I've made a whole YouTube channel dedicated to this concept that God is one. Um, infinity every day, but I can't explain it. That's that's the that's the issue is that it's not explainable. It's only experienceable. Um. So we're gonna end there because there's nothing more for me to say about it. God is one. Um, but there is some instruction about how you might how you might come to experience that that experience that God is one. So that's what the next part of this prayer is about, the via hafta. So that's what the next video is going to be about.